This conference will now be recorded. I love when she makes that announcement, whoever she is. We'll call her Betty. Okay, well today um, I have five artists. There's Anastasia Stepnova. Um, there's Joanne Fraser. I'm gonna skip the middle part of her name because I don't know how to pronounce it. Lisa Barnes, Phyllis Cahill, and Susan Dees. And today we're going to discuss how they went through the process of developing a line of jewelry and, and making it a signature part of their Um, so we'll be talking about how to start the process, what motivates, what motivations led to creating a line of jewelry, what struggles they needed to overcome, how they separated their style from other influences. I mean, we see jewelry all the time, and so that is a real difficult thing to create our voice from everybody else's voice. And um, they might give a little bit of advice for you to advance your path forward. After that, after our presentation, we're going to have a, a question and answer session. But I would like to point out, we have some giveaways and I didn't really mention that along the way, but surprise, we have some giveaways. So throughout the presentation, I'm gonna pause and we're going to give some fabulous things out. And if you notice, Chris put up one of his cultured opals and uh, he's real happy to, to be presenting that to somebody. Now, the reason for our Pay It Forward events is we have had some family difficulties about three years ago, uh, there was a, an explosion with my husband and my son, and there was such an outpouring from the community, uh, we felt like paying it back was the only way that we could possibly thank everybody. So usually every time about this time of year, we have some sort of events going on. So if you've signed up for this one, wonderful, you're taking advantage of it. If you um, haven't seen some of the other ones, you can sign up for those at my website. Uh, there's four other events that will be taking place and they'll be much like this with a presentation and a lot of juicy information. So um, without further ado, we'll, we'll, we'll get started. So what exactly is it uh, you're doing when you're trying to develop your voice? Well, oh, there's a lot of soul searching involved. And what we're trying to bring out is that uniqueness that makes us different than everybody else. What style and how our body of work looks different than others. Now, let me ask you a question and then you could answer this in the, um, the little bubble, the chat, if you can find it, it's a, it looks like a cartoon bubble and you could put your answer in there and we'll check them out along the way. How many of you wish to have folks identify your jewelry and recognize your pieces as unique without seeing your name, without seeing you behind your, your jewelry bench? How many of you would like to have that individual style that when you're scrolling on Facebook or you're pinning on Pinterest and you roll by a, a picture, you automatically know who the artist is. That's sort of a cool thing. So that's what we're going for here. So what exactly is a, a line of jewelry? What makes it a line? It's the cohesiveness that you see within the line. Um, you know, like a commonality, something that unifies the line. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that they're all exactly the same and that they're boring in any way, but there are some commonalities. And on the right, you'll see um, Lisa Barnes. She's one of the artists that we'll be talking about today. None of her pieces look alike, but there's a commonality with her, with her pieces that lets you know that they're all together. So we're gonna go into this in a little more detail but let's start getting an idea 
of what we're talking about here as far as you know a cohesive line now a lot of us probably have a hard time um we take a lot of classes we get a lot of influences from our teachers and maybe the books we're reading the videos we're seeing and we somehow want to separate from from that so you can have different lines of jewelry like you have different sides of your personality you can be political you can be funny you can be romantic and what we're doing with these different lines of jewelry is just within that line there is a cohesiveness it's almost like a definition of a, a set of words or a set of visual things that make your line look like they all belong together so if you look at this example this um, is by susan dees she's another one of our panelists today and um you can see that not all the pieces look the same however there are some commonalities through the pieces for instance the the minimalist lime work the angular shapes that are in there the use of crushed stones and inlay so those are just a couple things and we're going to get into susan's head a little bit more to find out what what is in what makes her different lines unique to her okay i just got a note passed by my husband <laughs> um so again you know a lot of people go well is it going to be boring if i'm doing a single line of jewelry no it shouldn't be um you can really put a variety in there but what you don't want to do is if your line of jewelry has a certain number of elements let's say it's always silver and it's always natural stones um you don't want to stick something with blingy schwarkowski crystals okay you want to stick to your definition of the line of jewelry that you're doing and so that's what i'm talking about you need a clear intention and um instead of having random styles come in you are going to keep that to a cohesive definition a definite clear intention so our first gal if you could um turn on your video your camera susan and turn on your mic we're going to start with you susan are you with us I'm here. Hi. Hi, everybody. Now, Susan has done several different lines of jewelry. And I find it, it, to me, this typifies what I'm saying about not sticking to one exact style or pigeonhole yourself into one place. But it does, to a certain extent, mean you need to be cohesive within each line. So you already saw her first line with the crushed inlay. And um, now we're going to see uh, one of her lines coming up. And first of all, I know that I put you through the ring or during class. Um, a lot these women all took the art of designing your own jewelry line. It's a course. And basically what it is, it's soul, it's a lot of soul searching. They all came with um, no specific idea of where they were going to take their life. So my first question to you is, how did you start the process of creating your own line? Well, um, first I started with you, thank goodness, because I had no idea where to start. Um, and then I, I started channeling my ideas into a sketchbook, into a journal. Um, and once I had that first piece on paper, the rest kind of came a bit easier. The first one's always the hardest to do. And so, and then once you have that one, the next come along. 
Okay. Let me, um, I want to show them the functional joy that you did in class. Can you give them the definition of what was to be in this line and what was not to be in this line of jewelry? Um, well, I think um, it was, I wanted to head down a uh, path of um, the, being outdoors and loving the outdoors. And I wanted to keep it um, organic and natural and, um, and use elements from outside. Okay, and what what was what was the motivation to this particular line? I re remember having a lengthy conversation about um, where you grew up and some of the buildings that you saw and things like that. Could you go into that a little bit more? That you you ladies will ladies and gents will find in her artist statement. So I'm having these um, panelists just highlight some of the things which you can read in more depth then. I think I accidentally muted you or you muted yourself. I'm sorry, Sue. Try that again. Um, I found myself um, going back to some fond memories growing up and um, camping in Maine. Um, and it was just our, we had simple vacations of camping every year. And um, we'd go on these hikes and on these hikes, we'd come across these buildings where there these old sheds or homes or homesteads that the kind of the earth has taken over the vines were coming through the trees were growing around the moss was on the um on the rooftops and these they were taken over by new life or one our life human life left it and the, the earth took it over and it was it always kind of um i kind of always loved and resonated toward that so can you tell us the definition of of items that we would find in this particular line of jewelry. Um, there's a cohesiveness to it with the kind of images, with the kind of gem quality and things like that. So what, what was your definition when you were making this line? Um, I think it was just um, the the earth, um, the trees. I love the textures of the bark on trees and um, the lakes and the water and the rivers that, that were around. Um, I love the eeriness of um, how the trees took over the buildings and how they how the landscape had changed um, from being a homestead to being earthy and, and it all becoming um, uh, uniquely um, in cohesiveness to each other. Okay, so um, if you remember in class, we talked a lot about the techniques and the stones and um, the tone of the piece. So can you walk us through some of those elements? Like I definitely see the eeriness that you're going to here. Um, well, I, I wanted to add uh, of course, the the texture of the bark in my pieces, I absolutely love that feeling. Um, and uh, and then the colors, I wanted more muted instead of bright and shiny, so I added the patinas. And the stones um, are just, you know, the kind of added to the eeriness and also the, you know, the water that was around me, some was dark and some was bright and some, um, I, so I kind of incorporated those stones, um, like the moonstones, more of an eerie, um, kind of iridescent feeling. And then the opal was just that bright and cheery feeling from, you know, incorporating the old with the new and the new with the old, it, it just, okay. if that makes sense. Well, the quality of your stones seem to be within a family. The, the metals are, it's all silver, they're patinaed, they have that eerie feeling. So there was, it was really like almost, if you were to look at the line, you'd see, a, you could probably pull out a list of words that would, would go from one piece to the next. Now here's another line of jewelry that you've done and it's quite different. And it's different again from those pieces that, um, that we showed at the beginning with the inlay, although these look a little bit like um, some growth from that, or those were done closely together because there's some similarities. 
what are your motivations here behind these pieces? And what would you say would be those list of words to, you know, to identify them? You used silver, you used oxidation, but there's an angular quality and a simplicity to the lime work. Well, I almost kind of um, felt I got into this niche of wanting to do um, almost like taking tattoo feeling and putting it into um, into a piece of silver, um, keeping it flat um, and not adding a lot of um, definition and curvature to it, um, almost like paper um, pieces stuck together. Um, I love the uh, patina to make everything pop. Um, and the shapes are very geometric at times um, to, and then with a quality of um, realism um, to envelope some of those, um, the trees and the water and, and wanting to hit um, the woods as well as the ocean and um, just a feeling, uh, you know, and then I added the simplicity of the um, simple line work um, again, in this piece and these pieces. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, you can really see that more of a linear quality versus the line before, which was more sculptural and dimensional. Now, before we let you go, um, I, I want to know, do you have advice for anybody about making their own line of jewelry? Um, sure, I, um, I'd find something that would inspire you. Um, do you love nature, the ocean, forest, or animals, domesticated or wildlife? Um, do you have more, or do you love more graphic shapes and designs, or more organic, um, more organic um, shapes? Uh, what stones, if any, do you like to use? Um, do you like more CZs or more natural stones? Um, transfer those thoughts on paper and and then pick textures and techniques that coexist with all the pieces in your line and, and have um, fun creating something that no one else has that makes it unique and yours. Okay. Now, before I let you go, um, I have a giveaway. I want to keep this active. Opinion. So we have some Prometheus clay, they, uh, copper. Um, I'd like you to pick a number from 1 to 65. Uh, number eight. Okay, so Chris is going to count down on our list of people um, because of the way they're organized. He can see them in a list and he will um, let me know which person has won the Prometheus clay. Awesome. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Now, uh, if we have any more questions for Susan, we're going to have a question and answer session. So uh, stay tuned for that. And then the panel will be up and you can ask them questions. So Chris, have you figured out who our eighth person is? Kalpana? I had, okay. to, I had to turn my mic on. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to tell you now or do you want me to just write you? You can tell. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is, a, uh, this is probably a first name maybe, but Kalpana. Hey, Kalpana, everybody give her a round of applause. She's going to be able to play with some Prometheus copper clay. And um, we're going to do this again as we go along. Of course, the very last giveaway will be that beautiful opal. So you have to stay, stay tuned until the end in order to get that. Um, at this time, I am not reading any of the comments as we go along. That's Chris's job. If I multitask, you'll, you'll hear a lot of dead space in between. So I'm gonna keep this rolling. Um, thanks a lot, Susan. I appreciate Thank your you. time um, to answer these questions and things like that, and just give a little bit about, about yourself. Thank you, Holly, for having me. I appreciate it. Mwah. Mwah. Okay. So getting back to what does a cohesive line of jewelry look like? 
and how do you achieve unity within different lines? So here are some of the common things that we're looking for. You want a common or universal theme throughout the line. Like Susan said, is it nature? Is it your love for animals? Is it your love for cats? Is it your conviction with politics um, or poverty or any particular topic? Um, throughout the line, is there a similar, similar combination or usage of colors? So let's say you wanted it to really pop. You decided to do um, complementary colors of, bl of blue and, and yellow and things like that. Well, that would be an exciting line of jewelry where you had complementary colors. But if you wanted something more subtle, you would use a different type of color palette. So there is, within the line, if you want it to pop, you're going to use those really popping kind of colors versus the soft tones. Um, you want a common technique or, or maybe even a signature technique. There are certain artists out there that have developed their own thing of using resin or the way they carve the clay or the way they... Uh, fold form the metal, those kinds of things. So when you're when you have something that's signature that definitely puts you um, into your own category, but the common use of techniques also comes through. And again, I will point back to Susan's examples of some of the lime work was very thin and minimalist and um, almost um, simplized, sim simplized, that's not a word. <laughs> they, they, they were smooth, they were sleek, they were, they're not, they were uncomplicated, so it was more of a minimalist line. Um, simplified, that's the word. Um, a similar family of textures or patterns. Um, there might be you know, you use stippling in this particular line. You use cross hatching. There's a certain kind of certain kind of bezel wires that you use, either the pattern ones or um, the very plain ones. So it's little things. It's in fact the things that make the difference are the little things. Um, it could be a repeat of elements. You saw a lot of minimalist lines and circles and triangles in her one line. You saw in the other line there was a lot of trees and branches and that tone of feeling a little bit on the eerie side. Um, and also the materials that you're using. You probably, like if you had a silver line of jewelry and then you had one copper piece, that one would really stick out. So you want to, you know, you can mix metals, of course. You can use silver and bronze and gold together, but you would want that theme to go up throughout the pieces for the most part. So let's talk to our next artist. This is Lisa Barnes. Lisa, would you um, unmute yourself and turn on your camera? Hello, Lisa. No, I couldn't hear you say that. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me now? I can. How are you? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. So, Lisa, I think I'm going to reduce the screen a little so you can see everything. Um, Lisa definitely developed a very unique line of jewelry where she was exploring the different elements. And she's very much into the metaphysical properties of her stones. So, um, Lisa, can you tell us a little bit about the line of jewelry that we're about to see? Or maybe I'll show it to them while we're, while we're discussing it. Sure. So, um, I'm sorry, go on. Sorry. Okay. Um, so my first line that I developed is based on the four elements, um, water, air, earth, and fire. Uh, the one on the left that you see here, that one's earth and the one on the right is air. 
Um, and so these four elements are inspired by um, Native Americans use the four elements a lot. And my designs are highly inspired by uh, the Southwest. Uh, I started my line after uh, many, many trips to Sedona, Arizona, where there are so many crystal shops, if you've ever been there, and everyone talks about the physical properties of and the metaphysical properties of gemstones. And so I wanted to be able to have those gemstones, but not just, you know, carry them in my pocket. I wanted to actually be able to show them off. So all of the stones that I use in these four elements go with that element. So for instance, earth, it's very grounding. Um, in this slide, you have fire on the left and water on the right, um, you know, fire, passion, um, so there's some stones that help with that and water is more calming and flowing. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I came up with for my first line after taking Holly's class on developing a signature style. Um, Lisa, so if we look at both these slides, these pieces don't look at all the same. However, they have a feel about them. Um, between one and the next. So can you tell us the list of elements that people find in each and every one of these? Sure. Um, well, the first thing is I try to use natural gemstones. So they're not dyed or funny colors. They tend to be more, um, they can be tumbled, but not necessarily faceted. And I also use spirals in all of Work. Uh, you'll see little spirals, you know, somewhere. Um, air, I uh, also use the four directions um, with the little four stones uh, at the very top. Um, Should I flip? Yeah, the and then, sure. And my pieces tend not to have too much texture on the metal themselves, which provided an extra challenge for me in terms of working with metal clay. Um, so it's more of a, the shape is more the outline with some, um, you know, accents. Um, and actually in water, it's hard to tell on this, but right underneath all those four little stones is also the Native American symbol for water. So I kind of pull in uh, those elements and those influences into all of my pieces. Okay, so the neat thing is, um, so in her line of jewelry, you would not see cut gems. You would not see, it. you would see the more um, natural stones that she's talking about and incorporating the mes metaphysical properties. But they also have these teeny little stones in them somewhere, which is sort of fun. So there's uh, what mo makes it cohesive that everything is the same, but there's a commonality, there's a feeling, the type of metals, or maybe the techniques. So in this case, it was these spirals, these small, um, these small teeny uh, cut stones, and the natural shapes of the, the larger stones, and this natural feel to them. Um, and now, what what was the biggest struggle to overcome, Lisa, when you were making this line? Well, mine was um, I I am highly influenced by a lot of different things, and there was one artist in particular that I was really enjoyed her jewelry, and so it was hard for me to kind of come up with my own style without. Uh, unconsciously kind of not copying but being very similar to someone else's style um, and I realized for me that's because as a child I moved around a lot so I kind of became a chameleon and I learned how to fit in and adapt and do what I needed to do like everyone else and so I realized that was like something that I've been dealing with for you know well 50 something years um, so at the beginning of the class I had developed a different line that was very similar to this other artist I admired and realized I kind of just had to get out of my head um, and come up with something else. And um, this line was um, 
developed at, in the in a car ride. Uh, I've been driving back and forth during COVID between New Jersey and Arizona, and basically driving through Ohio, I came up with the idea of the elements, and then my partner who was driving will, would say, well, what if the element, uh, you know, was more characteristic like such and such, and a little sketch, and then I don't recommend this to anyone. I was holding it up to the driver, and she took a quick look at it and said, oh, well, what if you did this? <laughs> so, we were on a long stretch of highway, nobody was around, um, but she basically helped me develop this line just by like asking me questions, getting me out of my own head and just like drawing and thinking about what else could I do that would be different. Hey, you can't beat that support from a, from a significant other. Um, well, that's really great. Do you have any advice to give everybody about making their own line of jewelry? Like how, how did you get it to be cohesive. I think that could be the hardest part. It was, but um, taking your class and your recommendations of just looking at what things do I like and can bring into each piece. So it was the spiral symbolism. It was the, the healing gemstones. Um, and again, you know, Use other things as an influence, but try not to look at maybe other jewelry designers, look at other artists, look at um, textiles and patterns and mosaic tiles and things like that um, to help inspire you and just try to separate yourself out. And don't worry about, you know, we always talk about, you know, you don't want to compare yourself to other jewelry artists and you might have something similar, but there is something unique about your own experience and what you want to do that will make you stand out and separate yourself from everyone else who's doing something similar. Okay, Lisa, um, is there anything else you want to tell us before I let you go? Um, Actually, really quickly, the only thing I want to say is as a result of this, so I had actually started my um, company two years ago, and I called it Life's a Gem, and I was doing stamped mandala pendants, and it was something completely different, but within the last uh, couple weeks, and uh, I didn't give, tell Holly uh, <laughs> that this was happening, but I've actually since changed the name of my company because the name of the company and the logo I'd come up with just didn't fit into this new signature style and kind of the direction I'm heading in. Um, so my company is now um, L Marjorie, which is my first initial and my middle name. Um, it, just, it just seems to fit. It seems to be something I can use for any line that I'm developing. Um, and it's not quite as, I don't know, some people were saying trite or cliche as life's a gem. Um, so if you wanna- So when people see the recording, they'll get it again? Yes, so it's L-M-A-R-J-O-R-I. And so I'm working on a new website, which will be lmarjorie.com. You can currently find me on Etsy and, um, yeah, so that that's exciting. It's it's coming full circle and not just developing a signature line, but kind of my whole identity. Um, that's and company. Thanks. Okay, up next is Phyllis Cahill. So Phyllis, if you could turn on your camera. Oh, you're quick. Her camera's on. Her her mic's up. She's ready to go. Um, now. Phyllis is a polymer clay artist and works with sheet metals. Um, Phyllis, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, the materials that you use? Sure. Um, like you were saying, I use metal, either copper or sterling silver, and more recently, precious metal clay and polymer. And I started out with polymer first, uh, well, it, because it's cheap and it's colorful and I really liked it. You can do so many things with it. And then I added the metal at a later time because it needs some more structure in my opinion. And, it, and I couldn't get anything shiny. I mean, there's metallic polymer, but there's nothing as shiny as real shiny metal. So that's how that came about. And I do riveting 
to attach the polymer to the metal. So let me ask you a question. You have these dainty little designs with your polymer. Where is the inspiration for that? Mainly from old quilts and quilting fabric, the tiny little patterns that are on quilting fabric, the old you know, subtle washed out colors. I really like that more than I do bright colors. So in class, you did um, this particular line of jewelry with the copper, and then later on, it was sort of a prototype to do it in silver. Now, if you notice, um, even though they're very much the same as far as design goes, the silver takes it into a totally, it, it, it changes the look about it quite a bit. So let me ask you a question. When you were making your line of jewelry, what struggles did you have to overcome the most? A lot of it is engineering. In this particular line, I wanted the necklace that's in the lower left, I wanted it to be able to move. I didn't want it to be like one solid thing. And so the joints, getting the joints on those so they would move smoothly, that was a, a technical challenge. And soldering is a challenge. <laughs> um, it takes a long, at least for me, it's taking a while to learn how to solder well and cleanly and get everything so it sticks together and doesn't fall apart. Sure. Yep, soldering is definitely one of those things worth mastering. Yes. So, um, how did you start the process of? of your line. I remember you coming in not quite sure what you wanted to do and over the course of 10 weeks this really evolved and grew and things like that. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes I, and I took the class because I felt really scattered like my jewelry was all over the place. I'd see something I'd like and I'd do something that was similar and I'd I needed to focus and I knew I needed focus. And so in the class, you led us through these exercises and I did, I did everyone religiously. I did all my homework. And in that process, I looked around my life, my home around, looked at things that I liked. And this commonality became very evident that was evident before. And you know how to ask very probing questions as well. <laughs> so what was not clear became clear during the class. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, I was, I'm, I'm glad about that. So if we look at this, what would you say would be the definition that you use to create this line? If you were to give it 10 descriptive words or eight descriptive words, whatever number you want to give, what would you describe? Um, the definition of your line being? Well, first of all, it uses leaf-like shapes. It's it's very much based on nature. It's got the, the leaf shapes. It's got this, the spiraling tendrils. It has um, the little round circles, the little dome circles. I think of those like I don't know, berries or flowers or some kind of a representation of a, you know, a, a berry or a flower. And then the, the patterns and the colors are soft and subtle and tiny. And um, I think that's about it. I, I, and I, I like to use square wire instead of round wire. I like to use the, the um, ball head rivets to hold the polymer to the middle. Is it the crispness of the square wires that you like to use? Yeah, I like that. I I like the, the edges on it and it's got more bulk. Maybe it doesn't have more bulk, but I just, it's different hmm. and it appeals to me. Okay. Now, if you were giving, going to give advice to other people about starting their oak line, um, how, would they, how would they start the process? Well, first, they need to sign up for your class. <laughs> I mean, that was that was just it. I mean, it changed my life, basically. So, um, and then do all the homework, 
um, be very honest with yourself. Be very dig deep to find out what your motivations are, what your intentions are, what really resonates with you. Because you want it to be something that is a reflection of you that you like well enough to continue for, you know, continue and expand upon for a, a period of time. And um, I would also say, look at what you don't like. Like if for myself, I don't like bright colors. I don't like sharp forms and shapes, even though these leaves are a little sharp on the ends. But um, if you know what you don't like, it kind of leads you to what you do like. And don't be afraid to throw out what doesn't work. If it doesn't work, out it goes. Well, we do we do, do a lot of soul searching in, in class of um of just knowing of discovering what it is that we're all about. What are these influences that have just gotten into our bones and comes out in the littlest ways in the things that we make and do. And we really take a good look at those things and capitalize on all of these experiences that we have and how we could turn that into art. So before you go anywhere, I've got another giveaway and you've got to pick a number from one to 67. 42. 42. Now what this is, is a proportional scale. I've had one of these forever. Um, and how you use it is you, um, you line up the front wheel and the back wheel with the number that, like let's say you want your piece to be a certain size and all, it, it is an existing size it will tell you how much that reproduction is. You can also, like when you're working and you need to work larger on the front end, so it's a certain size on the back end, this tells you how large, what size you need to work before you reduce it. So when it comes out of the kiln and it's reduced, what you'll end up getting. So this, I love this. And I plan on selling some of these in my online sale because I got a whole bunch from my, they're just great. Um, I actually started using this in another life when I did graphic design work. So um, these are really wonderful. Chris, do you know who that person is that would be getting this proportional scale? Well, I know who the winner is, but I'm not sure what their name is, but they are logged in as admin. And I know it's not one of us. <laughs> okay. Um, hmm. Is it the only person logged in is admin? Good question. I'll have to check that out and I'll get back to you. Okie dokie. Um, after this session, those that have won something will have to get in touch with us so we can have your address and we can send some things down to you. So thanks, Phyllis, for uh, picking a number and being part of the panel and letting us pick your brain a little bit. You know, there was one yeah. question for me in the chat. Do you want me to answer that now or later? I was just going to ask that. Go ahead. Um, the question is, do you ever mess up your riveting? Yes. <laughs> I've gotten what? <laughs> and I've made tools to make it easier for me to do everything right the first time but yes definitely messed it up quite a bit and what's the most durable finish for polymer um, if you mean like a varnish I don't usually varnish um, I find that if I do need to seal something to protect it I use resin and then I will um, gently sand it with a, a very fine um, sanding cloth to take down the shine because I don't like the shine. So you know what we're going to do Phyllis? We're going to take more questions and the question and answer session and I will have you, um, all of you, turn on your cameras and your mics and we'll answer a bunch of questions there. Um, I so appreciate you coming out today. So um, you're having me. No problem. So let's see, who do we have up next? We have Anastasia Stepnova. 
hopefully I pronounced your name properly. If you could turn on your camera and your mic. How oh, are you? Hello. What was that? It was hello. Hello. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into your line of doing? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm really happy to be here and thanks so much, Holly, for having me. And I live in Ireland and I'm originally from Russia and I have uh, different areas of design background and uh, I studied architecture but never worked as an architect. And I've always had the dream of creating jewelry and uh, started quite a few years ago and uh, it eventually poured into silversmithing and then uh, finding out about metal clay. With regards to the metal clay, I am still a learner. I still have so much to to learn and to to find out about it, but I'm really enjoying every every stage of it. That is really great. Is really great. Um, so let's take a look. Sorry, Holly, I couldn't hear you. There we go. Um, somebody came on and was not muted. Um, let's take a look at some of the jewelry that you've been creating and um, and talk about some of the inspirations to it. So I remember in the beginning, you were feeling a little unsure about where you wanted to go or how you would, you know, you've had some ideas and you had a little bit of trouble figuring out, okay, how am I going to put these into play? And then you did a little research, you did some sketches, you played around a little bit, and then you hit it. And then it started to flow out of you. It was really wonderful. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, when I started the um, signature jewelry line class with you, which was actually the best decision that I could make, um, I felt like I had, uh, I was ready to step up my game and to to go uh, into more elaborate designs and more personal designs, and I felt that I had those ideas bubbling out. I, on the inside of me, but I didn't know how to let them out. And uh, it was some sort of roadblock for me. I was creating um, nature inspired jewelry and it was a lot of leaves and twigs and those kind of things, which I still liked, but I really wanted to get away from that literal representation and to go into something more intentionally designed or more personal. So that was the, the beginning of that journey. And then I started just taking out little by, by little those ideas that were piling up inside of me and then unraveling them. So what was that aha moment, do you remember? The aha moment was, I actually don't remember how I said that I need to, to start drawing those textures, but it was that, that I actually I took um, a drawing pad and I started just uh, really quickly jotting down different patterns and textures with the ink and brush or ink and uh, a tiny pen and I made loads of them and then I photocopied them, chopped them up and started playing around with them as if I was making an, a collage. And it was an incredibly enjoyable process, probably also because I wasn't putting any pressure on myself with that. I didn't know yet what, where I was going to, but it was really important at that early stage just to let myself play and do it almost as a meditative process without thinking, oh, I'm going to chop this into a half circle or into a cucumber shape. I'm just cutting it out and then seeing where it goes. And then eventually when I combined a few of those shapes and patterns together, it just started looking like almost ready to make designs. 
so what is what would be your definition of of your line as far as the visual elements that that you've included in in everything what is the common thread uh, the common thread would be um the combination or the juxtaposition the contrast between the natural shapes which i still really like like those sculptured twigs for example and uh the textures which are man-made woman made created by hand um i'm trying to uh, include uh, both of those elements in every piece and uh, sometimes also some almost industrial elements like those cylindrical supports that i use for the twigs with, again i allowed myself to play around yeah with those a little bit to add a little bit of irony maybe or postmodernistic approach to those because there is not something that you see in the real world or would make sense in in real world the industrial looking support for it wig it's not something that's this would probably exist so you like the contrast um between the twigs the industrial and the patterns um yeah your, your bright silver and your dark contrast yeah the the contrast or the um the dichotomy is something that i i always liked and uh, i just felt like i had no other choice rather than including it in my work that's great like i, I love it how you feel like sort of compelled to create and i love the way that you're um experimenting you know you're drawing you're cutting and then you're reassembling and things like that that sounds like a lot of fun in in the way that you came across it it sure is so is there anything else you want to tell us a little uh, about like how how what would you um recommend to others in creating their own line i mean after when you, when you start and you're looking at a white piece of paper that is or or your empty desk what's a really good starting point at that i think i would probably start with uh, something that gives you like a wow effect anything that just makes you say oh, i love this anything at all something you see outside like a nice uh, stick or leaf or or a rock outside or maybe another artist's work even that inspires you or even another discipline of art that's but something that makes your heart skip a bit but also at the same time not to jump on that immediately before answering to yourself why do i like it or where do i want to go with it what do i want to do with it and for that i was super grateful to you holly with your difficult questions that you were asking i was actually exhausted after after every session because you know you think like oh i'm ready i thought about this and i'm so cool i have an idea and then bam holly asks why is that why are you saying this and you understand that there are so many levels to go deeper in that and i think that was one of the most important takeaways for me just not to stop on the first level of saying wow i like this just push yourself to go deeper and then again and again many many times yeah there's so many levels to why we create and sometimes just being asked the right questions to go a level deeper um makes the jewelry that you make a little bit more meaningful for you as well as whoever is going to be the receiver of that even if it's you <laughs> But, um, oh, great. Okay. Is there any other advice that you'd like to give before you, you go? Mm, then probably regarding inspiration or influence with other, uh, from other artists, I think it is super important to be careful with that. And I learned doing it with time, maybe to, to measure the amount of inspiration that you intake from other artists not to fall into comparing yourself to others or not to get lost um, among other artists works or if you see that something is inspiring 
inspiring you to create again ask yourself those questions what exactly and uh, how it speaks to me or how i would uh, translate it into my language well i could definitely see some of your architectural influences and your love for nature combined into this jewelry line so i'll be interested to see what comes up next for you thank you thank you so much holly so stick around, we'll be asking you questions a little later. Mm -hmm. Okay, up next is Joanne Frazier. Joanne, can you turn on your camera and your microphone? Come on, there we go. We can hear I, you. I, must not have, I don't think I have fingerprints left. I have a touch screen and <laughs> I wasn't coming up, so. I still don't see you. You don't. I'm here. Oh, I see you now. Okay. Now I don't see me. Now you disappeared, Holly. Okay. Gotcha. There okay. we are. So let's see. Um, you went quite a journey developing your line. And I did. You, it was. When you hit your aha moment, it was like for all of us, yay, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. So tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, I, I always, I, I love flowers and I like being outside. Um, my favorite place is Longwood Gardens and I'm leaving here to go there because I go there as often as possible. But I always draw and draw and draw. Um, the things that I see, the flowers, um, sometimes I'm quite literal. And for this line, I said, Holly, I'm going to do something really simple. And you said, Joe, you don't do simple. So, <laughs> um, so, so it, it's just, it's more representational um, than um, actual portrayal of flowers than I usually do. So it's more line drawings and things like that i i was you know we were studying other eras of jewelry which was really helpful i really liked edwardian and i liked art deco um i kind of steer away from symmetry in a lot of cases because i have a hard time getting things symmetrical and i want it perfect and so this was a challenge because i i like symmetry and i wanted to to use that in in this line so i i that was one of my um things to work through is is how i get things even and and symmetrical and um and enjoy it so your centerpiece is symmetrical your your scroll work isn't right okay yes although in these it is <laughs> although in these it is yes Sometimes I was trying for it and, you know, it, <laughs> uh, so anyway, but it, it was quite the journey, yes. So um, what was some of your process to getting to the end? I mean, you've always liked flowers. You like, you have a background in doing the wire work. And yes. so how did you combine these two together? Well, I have never been able to do snakes. I don't know why I can't do snakes. So, um, you know, when talking about process, I spent a while working on the process, which was frustrating. It's like, how am I going to get what I want? I tried wire with clay, which was an interesting thing. Didn't like the way that looked, but I'm still working on that because anyway, I, I'm stuck on that somewhere. But um, so, yeah, I used an extruder for these and then shape them after I extruded them and I found out, oh wait, I can do um, snakes. And I guess for those of you who are not snake challenged, it's, um, you know, um, but but yes, uh, it was it was interesting. It wasn't the whole process was interesting. Um, you helped me very much with the photopolymer plates, which, which was great technique for this style because um, I could transmit translate my line drawings into the pictures that I wanted in the clay. So that was like really, um, really helpful. And um, so you said your motivations were your love of floral and Edwardian. And mm -hmm. so 
you know, one of the things that we do in class is we try not to do what somebody else is already doing out in the art world. So part of the um, part of the soul searching is seeing what's out there in the genre, genre that you're interested in. So when you were doing this, um, you were so excited when you came, you said, okay, I'm not seeing this kind of combination anywhere. And so that was one of those really, oh, I'm, I'm there, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm arriving in some way. So that was really, really a cool thing. Um, so you're talking about some of the challenges were overcoming the technique mostly, trying to get your yes. down. Okay. So what kind of advice would you give to other artists about starting this thing? I mean, you know, I remember some of the early drawings were, you know, in the beginning, everybody's things are half-baked. How do you go from a half-baked idea to a fully-baked idea? <laughs> well, I think, you know, the, the journaling idea was really good because you start to look at um, different things you see out there and, and you just keep drawing and drawing and drawing. And what's really odd is I, I keep a sketchbook and I, I have, well, I have many of them. But um, I actually went back to some of my older things and said, you know, what did I like? And what did I not like? What 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 worked for this and what didn't? So some of my stuff was actually earlier work that I was like, oh wait, I'm reimagining it now through this lens. And so I was able to adapt some things that I had done, like the like the piece on the right, the plume I had done for something else. Um, but I was like, wait, now it'll work for this. So that's the only thing that's not really a floral in in that whole um, collection. But that I, you know, I, I found that that's good to just keep the journals going, keep looking at things and keep um, keep sketching, just keep, you know, and, and keep your stuff and look at your old stuff and see where you've been and, and where you want to go now. Yeah, it's fun in that class because we have where we started and then we, you know, where we got to. And I always take us down to where we started because none of you believe that you'll ever get to the the end you know you're you know and so that's sort of cool <laughs> it is but, and the nice thing is that i have to say with your classes and everything the nice thing is you have a week in between to reflect on what you're doing and that to me is very precious because um you get to you get a chance to look at it after other people have commented and you you can reflect on on that journey and that's very helpful to me anyway well, I have you all write um, an artist statement, and it's more or less for clarity on where you're going. Um, how did your artist statement uh, develop and become something that made clear, that brought clarity to this whole idea? Um, I guess it. I guess it's writing down what the influences were, and you know, you start with bullet points, and then you kind of string them together. Um, but we did that. We, we were like, okay, what did I do? What was the process? What did I just do? I, I mean, I draw, I draw a lot of flowers, um, but how did that end up being pieces of jewelry? And stringing that together, it is very clarifying. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, wait, where, where was I and where am I going? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a nice part of the process. And um really makes you realize, okay, this is not what I'm doing. <laughs> what I am doing. So that that's really great. Um, so we're now to the question and answer part of this. So I'd like to see my panel, pull your pictures up, um, open up your mics, and um, I'm going to turn off the background for a second here. And I'm going to need Chris's help in uh, feeding us the questions because, again, I am not a good multitasker. Um, I'm not going to. Be Anna, uh, it's just the panel that is up at this point. So if you could turn, if everybody could keep their camera off except for the pet. Great. Thank you. Although you're a lovely, you have such a lovely face. It's nice seeing you. 
Um, I don't know if we could get Chris to turn on his camera. He likes being behind the scenes anonymously, so um, I don't think that's going to happen. But anyway, can you feed us the questions, Chris, that you're getting in in the um, in the question and answer section of this? So everybody has an opportunity. If you've got a question. Uh, Chris is going to read it out, and we'll see what we can do about answering those. Yeah, I'm going to have to wait until some questions come in, because there were a few questions, but they did get answered. Um, so as they come up, I'll, I'll feed them to you. Oh, okay. So if anybody has thought of making a line of jewelry, I'd like to know what's stopping you. What is the thing that is getting in the way? And are you being influenced by your instructors, your um, the things that you see on Facebook, the things that you see on Pinterest? Are things like that getting in the way, or do you not know where to start? Okay, I do have a question here. This is for Anastasia. Do you cast your twigs and leaf forms, or do you sculpt them from metal clay? You've got to turn your mic on, and so do you, Lisa. Actually, it is on. Are you talking to Anastasia? Anastasia, yeah. Yes, great. Sorry. There you go. Okay, now it it was just spinning and spinning and wouldn't wouldn't turn on. Uh, so for my tweaks, I made uh, one of those actually on on this piece that. I'm wearing here. Uh, I made it with the silicone mold, so I used an actual twig and create, created a mold of it, and uh, used the clay then to to form it. It was just a, a one-sided mold, so I had to sculpt a little bit the the back of it to make it look uh, natural on all sides. And all the other twigs that you saw, they are all uh, hand sculpted and then carved a little bit after they uh, they dried. It's fascinating to, to hear the process of how everybody does things. And I notice everybody's wearing like one of their signature line pieces. So you should all like hold it up and like see what it is. Oh, I'm like, not. <laughs> I have something different on. <laughs> Is there any other questions, Chris? Um, I'm trying to uh, weed through the questions as they pertain to the presenters at this point, and I do not have anything at this point. It, it could be any, you know, it could be about the class, it could be about the presenters' projects, whatever, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, well, Holly, this one's for you. Uh, there was a question as to whether the uh, presentation today was going to be available. I, I did record it. I remembered to hit the record button. So yes, it, it's always a that depends kind of answer. Did I hit the record button? Yes. So I did. I did. So it will be available. Okay. And let's see. Now here's a question that. Okay. This I, it's a legitimate question, and I guess you you know it's it's up to you whether whoever wants to answer it, but. The question is, is everybody working full time and able to support themselves with their art? Okay, why don't we go around the circle and I'll select you and you can tell me the answer to that question. Joanne. I'm working kind of full time, but I am retired from another career and I do this for fun. I make enough money to buy more stuff to make more stuff. Susan. Same here. Um, I am a retired graphic designer and got into this and I do sell my pieces just so I can make more. I don't make a lot on it, but I love to be able, I'm actually supporting my addiction. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy with that. Lisa. Um, I am doing this as a business, though I'm not doing it full time yet. Uh, I do have other part time work that supplements my income. And I'm also in the fortunate position to have a partner 
who has a really good full-time job, so she supports me as well. So um, I do not have enough hours in the day to spend full-time on my uh, jewelry making, but hopefully I will in the future when things start to sell. Anastasia, how about you? I work full-time on a muggle job that pays the bills and I make jewelry in my free time. I have it as a tiny, teeny tiny business just to cover the costs somewhat for the materials and tools to feel less guilty on spending all those amounts on new shiny tools and materials. But now, unfortunately, it's only a side uh, activity for me at the moment, yes. Tell us. It is my intention to work at this full time and to make money at it. And I was on the track. I was on track. I was making some money and then COVID hit and everything went up in the air and festivals were canceled and, you know, what happened anyway. Um, I spend a lot of time making jewelry. I do not have an outside job. I do some design work for my husband and mainly I work on jewelry. Oh, okay. I do this as a full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So do you have any other questions for us, Chris? I do. Here's a good um, topic here, and this is probably based around focus, but the person is asking, I think the thing that's, that is stopping me is that I've been trying different mediums, so it's hard to do a line when I haven't stuck to one medium. And and the question on that is that that would be true. Um, when you're, you know, maybe it's a matter of stopping for a period of time and really exploring what that one thing can do and what you know, experimenting with all the different techniques that are, are based on that. But what it's true, when you're hopping around and things like that, um, that focus isn't there. So what my suggestion is, is you can do the other things, but um, what I would do is do those things as a hobby and do this as, okay, I'm gonna concentrate on this. I'm going to really figure out what this can do, what it can't do, what I can do with it, and that kind of thing. Because without the focus, that cohesive piece and that unity, it's hard to get that there, if not impossible. <laughs> and this is a question to all of the presenters. Do you notice a difference in your customers' responses after you develop a signature line? Yeah. Okay, let's go around again. We'll start with Phyllis. Mm. Well, I, with a line, it's nice to have things in different price ranges. So you have like a, a showpiece that costs the most, and then you have pieces that are kind of uh, takeoffs on that that cost less. So say somebody really likes something, but their budget isn't very high, then they can buy a little piece and they have a little bit of that, and they can maybe next year come back and buy another piece. How about you, Anastasia? Mm, it's difficult to say at the moment because um, I saw different response to my signature pieces, that's for sure. There was more, uh, I sold a few of them, and it was the response, like a person saw them and said, oh, yes, this. So it was a piece that, really spoke to that person. Uh, I cannot say that I, it generated a massive commercial turnaround for me, but I'm not really aiming at that too much, wouldn't have too much to promote it or to, to target uh, uh, more sales. So hard to say, but the, the positive feedback has been there definitely. I think um, the marketing of a line also has a huge influence on how popular it gets. Um, Susan, how about you? Um, I found that it did kind of help. Um, if I had added earrings or the pendant and the bracelet, um, people would buy all three. 
Um, mm -hmm. Or they would buy a piece and then call me later and say, do you still have that or can you make that uh, to match? Um, so it did help in that respect. Um, and then if I come out with something again along that line, um, they like to gobble it up. It's, 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 I've had to recreate several pieces for different people. So. How about you, Lisa? So I just launched the signature line a few weeks ago, actually. Um, and prior to that, I'd been doing kind of some other things. So I can't really tell yet about customer's perception, but I can tell you that it's definitely helped me uh, gain focus and kind of know where I want to go with things. So it's um, having a signature line and going through the process of developing that and taking class uh, has really given me a sense of, okay, now I know where I want to go and what other pieces I want to develop to go with that. And um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely gotten some good feedback from this line. Um, the other things I was doing, like maybe I would sell one thing on Etsy once a year. So <laughs> hopefully, you know, this will definitely show in sales and customer interest as well. So. And Joanne. Um, I've sold a couple of the pieces from the line. Um, it does make a really nice cohesive presentation and it does, it's very eye catching. So whether it's someone's style and they're going to be interested in it, if it's not their style, you know, it's not, but at least I can, um, it, it, it's a conversation starter. I, I'd say I, I have like basically four different lines going. So, you know, it's kind of hard to say. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know what? Um, I have a couple lines of jewelry. One is really funny. It's um, the whimsical critters. And then I have a more romantic line. And I actually have several lines. But the thing is, what, what is good for me is the outlet that it provides for me for self-expression in having different lines. Like for, I, I would look at other people's things that had humor to it loved it but could never do it and when i figured out a way to do it it was a great outlet but when i have a table set up and i'm very perceptive to what people are paying attention to first of all i pay attention to what they're wearing and i'll be darned they're usually drawn to like things so when i can figure out a little bit about them i can take them to different places in my booth and start a conversation about that type of joy, or if they pick something up, you know, then I can put them to other things within that line of jewelry. So um, for a, a marketing point of view, um, that it, it can be very helpful. And of course, marketing is a whole other topic here, but um, you know, when you're marketing correctly and things like that, um, you know, you're hitting, you can hit your audience if you're really paying attention to the, the demographics of your audience. Is there any more questions, Chris? Yes, I have another one here. I'm gonna merge two questions. Uh, one was, have any of you developed more than one signature line? And the question to be answered is, I wonder how one manages having different lines at one time. Well, Susan, um, we per, we showed three different lines of your jewelry, so this might be a good one for you to answer. Um, can you ask it again, just so I can digest so how one yeah. relates to the next? <clears throat> Uh, the the first part of the question was, I wonder, um, actually, no, that wasn't it. It was, have any of you developed more than one signature line? And the second part is, how do you manage that at the same time? Um, managing it, I just, um, I keep adding to it. Um, the, and the one that gets the most attention. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to get more creative and not get stuck on one thing. Um, so I do like coming up with different ideas uh, for each different line. And um, yeah, so. I think the thing is with different lines of jewelry, it's like different sides of your personality. How can you have a, you know, a political discussion around the table with one group of people and then have a, you know, 
uh, a knee slapping comedy routine with another set of people. I don't miss when my, my drink almost went. Anyway, so um, you are not doing both things exactly at the same time, but there might be a day that you feel like I'm in this kind of mood and this is what comes out of me. And another day where another thing is what is presented. Exactly. How about you go ahead? You have um, a couple lines of jewelry. Can you answer? Can you bring light to that question? Um, yeah, most of my, well, I have different lines because I, I like, I don't know who else was saying, you jumping around on different media. I like working in different media. I started out as a silversmith um, and I do a lot of the scroll work in the silver. Um, so they're related, but because they're different media, they look different. Um, I also do resin work. So yeah, it's it's kind of, I kind of made little departments in my booth and oddly that um, didn't work. I, I thought that that to put, the, you know, it, it's better to oddly, I have an odd combination of things all over, just kind of like subjects, like I put all the floral things together and and that works better for whatever reason. Um, but they're kind of related in a way, but they're kind of not. So, you know, it's it's, I don't know that I can say I'm totally successful, but I enjoy a lot of different things. So I do it. I think probably in your booth when you're doing like, uh, it's cohesive. You know, it's yes. easier to look at than your eye bouncing all over the place and seeing different, you know, motivations. It's it's almost like when you go to a website and they got one thing flashing, sale, sale, sale. Well, then you go to another website and then like everything's flashing. What do you look at? So when you help them decide where to look at, it makes it a lot easier for them to see what you want them to see. Yes, yes. Chris, any more questions? Sure, I will merge another couple of questions here. And this is for everybody. Um, the question is, how many collections do you make per year? And how many pieces does a collection have to have, at least, in it? Well, in the class, I have them do five. Um, it could have as many as you you want. Um, could you ask that again? <laughs> yeah, the first part was how many collections per year are you making, all of you? Um, and then the other part is how many pieces need to be in a collection? minimum who wants to jump in and, and lisa well i mean the generic answer is you do as many collections as you have time for um i started the signature collection in holly's class last january i came up with the concept and the designs in february and so here it is december now you know developing the signature line was also coming up with your voice and what do you want to make and so there was a lot of extra time involved in developing this collection than I anticipate and I hope in the future um, but I also kind of look at it as like the fashion world you know designers are designing collections for different seasons and so they do what like four a year so my hope is to do two big ones and then I also am very cognizant of making sure that I have um, things and other price points that maybe aren't part of a collection per se, or a smaller type of collection that are more, not simple, but not as time intensive, not as, um, you know, not as much material costs to make the final pieces something more affordable. So there's more of a beginning price point for new customers to kind of work their way up to like my, you know, high end signature uh, pendant. So, um, and going back to how many pieces in a collection, well, I, I started with four pendants since it was based on the four elements, but I also did earrings to go with them and had plans of also doing bracelets uh, because I do believe if you do a full set of something, people will, tech, will tend to buy more than one piece. And I do that. If, I, I'm, if I'm wearing a pendant, I want to make sure I have a pair of earrings to go with it at least. <laughs> okay. Um some of it also has to do with process 
Like if you're doing, I, I did a wholesale line of jewelry and there was no way I wanted to whip off the same exact, you know, pendant a hundred times. So I got it casted. So I took forever to make my master and then I sent it to a caster. And so I had um, pendants, bracelets, earrings, and some ancillary items. And, um, and I was able to reproduce it in a way that lowered my price point and let me wholesale it to as many different outlets as I wanted to. So I think it also depends on how you're making something as far as how much, you know, how, how much you're putting into it and things like that. But in, in this particular class, there's a lot of, you know, it's 10 weeks of soul searching and putting this line together. But once you figure out how to do it, you could do any number of lines that you want to do. It's just in class, we focused on the one. Had to have five pieces. Now, it could definitely have, have more, but for the time element, things like that, that made a lot of sense. Anybody else have anything to throw into that question? Go for it, Phyllis. If I look back at this year, I would say I spent about three months developing a new collection. I'm still working on it. And the rest of the time has been developing other existing collections, adding colors, adding um, earrings, or just variations of what already exists. Okay, great. Is there any more questions, Chris? Yeah, there were several questions about asking about uh, multiples of pieces or one of a kind pieces, I guess one versus the other. Um, I'm trying to figure out the question part of it. Um, well, basically are, are, are people making duplicate designs, I guess maybe with casting i'm not sure or you're just selling your one-of-a-kind unique pieces mostly well i've done a little of both um i needed a bread and butter which was the casting line um the amount of time i take to do a one-of-a-kind piece is a lot longer than when you know i take it to all the time i want for one piece and then i send it out to get casted so um it became a bread and butter because I can lower the price point and things like that. One of a kind pieces take a lot longer and they're going to be more expensive. Who else wants to chime in on this particular topic? Anybody else cast? I haven't. Not yet. Okay. I tend to make, um, if I find a piece that's popular, I'll make one or two at the same time. Um, sometimes three or four and um, and then they inevitably since you put it out there it ends up getting sold <laughs> but it is it um, hopefully you know if you have a, a stone that you can't reproduce then of course then you have your one of a kind um, if you have a silver piece that um, you can usually probably duplicate it um, casting would, is something that I would love to look into eventually but I uh, have not I've looked into it but I haven't gone down that aisle yet okay um i actually have a, cl a class on that but that's another story um yeah it's it's uh sometimes it's a matter of figuring out how to talk to the caster and what kind of mold do i get and mm -hmm. what are the in and outs and how do you make it so it reproduces well and all that stuff so um it, it can be a, a good option but then you're doing a little bit of mass production in the fact like you're making 50 pairs of earrings, you're making 50 bracelets, you know, and um, one of my issues is having enough attention span to not want to just do one one off, you know. <laughs> I think that might be for many of us artists. Uh, Phyllis. Yes, I wanted to talk a little bit about production because I don't, I don't cast anything, but I do do multiples and the more you do the same thing the faster you get at it i keep written instructions of how i do it I have templates i have things on my computer so i try to make it as easy as i can for myself to reproduce it multiple times great 
Um, yeah, I think making notes of what you're doing, if you're going to make multiples, is what does it for me. I That's one of the things I do in my books. I make, when in my sterling silver jewelry, I make similar things. I kind of riff on a theme. And what sells those are the stones. I mean, hands down, people see a stone they like. I, I can't tell you how many times they're like, I really like this stone, but I like this other, you know, setting or the way you've 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 said at this time and it's like well I, I can't do anything about that because the stone is the stone but um but that's what attracts people i think it's it's you know whatever attracts them to your um line then you've got to say well these are related things or or whatever but i i never do the same thing exactly twice but taking good notes um i can usually do similar things you know that's a great tip. <laughs> um, is there anything else, Chris, or should we go on to the next, you know, next um, giveaway or whatever? Well, let me try to fit a, uh, there's been several questions on um, the various avenues of selling pieces, such as art festivals, um, markets, um, online platforms, Etsy, Square, or website, Facebook, Instagram. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm sure everybody probably has uh, different successes with um, these different things. Okay. Well, I think we'll keep this short because it's sort of outside the scope of, of where we were going with finding your artistic voice, but we'll give that a little bit of a go and um, keep it on the shorter side. How's that? Anybody else want to chime in on that? Where you're selling that's that's for you? Okay, um, Phyllis? Um, I sell at festivals. I sell at a few galleries. I am a member of a co-op gallery. I have a website. Um, that's about it. Is there anything works better than others? The in-person selling, if yes. that's where you can make a connection with somebody, that that makes that's the easiest. Okay, I understand. I get that. I totally get that. Um, Lisa, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I do a little bit of all of them, and I think it's important that we diversify our, our selling streams just to have a successful business. Um, I really enjoy doing the in-person events. I know a lot of people don't. I mean, it is exhausting when you're standing on your feet for 12 hours at, you know, a festival where people are walking by and you have to set up and tear down and all of that. But I do those. I also have my pieces at a gallery, keeping in mind then that you're getting, you know, half of the cost, uh, half of the fee that you would get in, if you're selling direct to the customer, if you're selling retail um, and selling wholesale to galleries and things like that. And I do have, well, I started an Etsy shop and now I'm developing my own website and I'm probably going to keep both, but I'm going to try to get people to my website again, um, you know, keeping in mind that places like Etsy, you can't collect your customers email addresses without asking them directly. You don't own your own content. Um, Etsy can kick you off and then you've lost all your you know, your selling resource. So uh, I'm working on, you know, trying to get customers over to my website. Um, and of course, there's marketing around that, newsletter, email lists, and all that goes hand in hand, social media, et cetera. Well, I will add this. I know that COVID has added a, um, a strain to a lot of the in-person festivals or even them taking place and things like that. So I think it's important to learn how to sort of contour to some of the things that are going on. I agree with Phyllis about the in-person connections. Um, I do that with my classes. My classes are really small. I want to talk to everybody. I don't want stadiums where I'm not connecting. I think the connecting is important. So the, the, the switch that I'm referring to is um, if you want to sell online, is there a possibility for them to have a personal com um, consultation with you where you can show them pictures, show them the jewelry, make that personal connection if you can't do it literally in person. 
So it does take a lot of creative thinking to to change things. I know before COVID, um, a lot of the fairs were str are struggling, and um, I think that we all need to think about how to do them when we are doing them to do them differently. What are we going to do? I mean, everybody's standing around behind their booth. What are we going to do to get them off the aisle and into our store? Okay, that's the big question. How do you bring them in to actually talk to them? So, um, so I throw out that challenge to you all and how to be creative in this new environment. And I know it's tough. Holly, I had a, just recently in October, I had an opening in my home. Um, okay. And I invited my friends and they were allowed to bring some friends. And I had up on my TV, I had a rolling um, uh, kind of a slideshow of how my things were made and and uh, the clay pieces as well as, you know, just the processes of making the pieces. And then I had my sketchbook out and people were flipping through that and say, oh, I really love this. Can you do this again or whatever? I walked out of there with. I mean, it was so unbelievably successful to okay. do it that way because I haven't been able to go to festivals or do any of that um, out here in California. We were still shut down, so um, it was it was it was fun and and you know you give them a little bit of wine and <laughs> and, and the sales go right out the roof. <laughs> but it was a it was a fun opening. Yeah, I've done a, uh, I've done some parties like that, like at uh, some friend's house, and then there's some sort of incentives of, you know, so that they can get some sort of jewelry reward for actually having the party and things like that, and door prizes and, mm -hmm. and stuff. So they they can be really, they can work really well. Is there any other questions, Chris? Um. I don't, well, I think there's some questions directed towards you, but with the time limit, maybe we should probably, maybe you should contact um, uh, concerning classes and things like that. How about this? Um, we'll put an end to this. I'll stay on if anybody's got any questions for me. Maybe you'll help me with that, Chris. Sure. Yep. Okay. Um, wow, this has been fun. Okay, let me back to my little presentation here. So anyway, you ladies have been wonderful. I really lay, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and letting people get a little bit of an insight to the process of making their own line. I know none of us rehearsed this. You did wonderfully. And so I'm really proud of you guys. Um, in the handout, there's um, there are their websites. I know that Phyllis has a really great tech blog where she gives information. So, but each one of them has a really nice, you know, they have connections either on Instagram or a website. And I know Lisa's in the development, so you'll have to give her a couple of days or, or a week or something before she gets that completely finished. But I bet it, it will totally be worth it. Um, I have mine coming up too, Holly. My website coming up. Here shortly. Awesome. Great. Yeah, so you'll have to announce you'll you'll have to get that link on our Instagram because that's what is through this presentation is your Instagram. So you'll put that up at the top of your profile, okay? Thank um, you. One thing I wanted to let you know before we do the last giveaway of the opal. Oh my God, it's a beautiful opal. I get so jealous having these around all the time and. They're always for sale. I don't get to keep, every once in a while it throws me a bone and I'm like totally happy. But um, I'm having a gift certificate sale. That means it's 15% off the gift certificates. I also have the art of designing a jewelry line up on the calendar if anybody is interested in taking it with me. Um, it's quite the journey and it's a lot of soul searching and you make a line of jewelry. We study a lot of other artists in their line of jewelry, what makes them cohesive. Um, and there's a lot of exercises during the way. So you're not just thrown to the wolves, you are directed in many ways. So uh, that's coming up in January and you could take a look at that on my website. 
And let's see. Aha, uh -huh. Chris, I'm going to let you. Um, well, do you want to pick a number? You want me to throw it out to one of the girls to pick a number? Throw it out to somebody. Okay, Anastasia, will you pick a number for Chris? He doesn't want this look rigged at all. <laughs> okay, so the number is 37. 37. So um, Chris is looking for the name, but I'll tell you a little bit about the opals. This is what? one opal, two sides. What, Chris? I do have the name. Okay, who? Okay, so the winner of the opal is Patricia Wheeler. Woohoo, Patricia! Yay. Congratulations! Okay. So all those that want something, please um, send us an email. You have my email. That's how you got your invite. So send me send me your addresses and things like that. Chris, can you tell us a little bit about the opal since um, you know better than me, and now that you don't have another job, you can do that. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> well, I can say that the picture does not do this justice. <laughs> not that it's a bad picture, but you know, as you know, with opals uh, in particular, it's very hard to capture the flash and the brilliance of things. But in the upper right-hand corner, there's this fabulous green sparkle flash that really complements. Um, everything else and the way that i see it is they're actually to me looks like a little blue bird up in the upper right hand corner and the green flash uh looks like tree leaves sort of shimmering in the wind a little bit and you can see the branches of the tree as they come down a little bit further um to the base of the stone but it's a very i think it's a very very pretty stone and uh, i would really enjoy seeing how uh patricia is going to use it so she has to get busy on that and uh, send some photos in. <laughs> yeah, we, we love the photos and um, it, it just feels good to see like what they become, what, what they become when they grow up. So he's got auctions every Friday on his Facebook page, Christopher Gage. And, um, and this conversation is going to continue um, on the Metal Clay Mixed Media Group. I'm hoping our panel will pop in from time to time and help with moderating those discussions and things like that. But we wanna help some of you get on your way with making your own line. So here's the, here's the challenge. Um, I'd like to see some of you put some sketches up on, on Metal Clay and Mixed Media page and then help them get realized and um, be bold enough to show and and allow people to help you along your journey. So it's a really nice forum like that. So finally, we would both like to thank you for allowing uh, for coming. Um, this would be no fun if nobody was here. That's for sure. But. Um, we we really have appreciated the support that we get from we've gotten from this community and i feel it every day um we don't forget about it and the journey that we're on is continuing um we've learned so much about trauma and we're moving forward to helping other people deal with their trauma and things like that so Stay tuned for that. We've got some things coming up that we're hoping to to do with it, and it's all uh, nothing is possible without the without support. It really isn't, and that's what we're both very very grateful for. I second that. So I have another um, pay it forward event. I don't even know the date, or I'd push it towards that direction, it's on my website at the bottom of the page if you'd like to join another one. Um, your feedback would be great. And um, I hope you move forward with finding your voice and coming up with something with it. So I'm gonna stick on um, for anybody that has questions directly for me and I'd be happy to answer them. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me. I, uh, you made it perfect. Really helped out so much, and I will be in touch with with you guys. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Holly, did you want me to address some of those questions? Sure, that would if they're, if they're still around. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Everybody's dropping off now, so. It's hard to tell who's still around. Yeah. Well, we could try it, and I'll just go from there. Okay. I'm still around, Barbara said. Well, some of the questions were, there was one question, uh, if there was any particular order that a student should take your classes. I think it depends on skill. Um, if you, the thing is like sometimes if you don't have certain skills to achieve a certain thing, that can be frustrating. It's sort of like a, a writer without the proper words to, to use. So, um, if you feel confident in your skills anytime, I have two courses that tend to go one after another, and one is called Designing with Intention. And we're talking about all the design basics and um, how to use volume and space and line and design and symmetry and focus and a lot of the things that people that have come from a hobby background are not as familiar with. And there's a good deal in the metal clay community that don't have you know, like a college art education, and that's totally fine. This is for anybody. So people usually take the designing with intention, and then they take the art of designing your own jewelry line. Now, if they know their basics, skipping right to the art of designing your own jewelry line is perfect. And can you give any information about, you had mentioned the class that you have on casting? Um. I have a whole handout on that, and um, it'll probably be in my, um, it'll probably be offered in the sale that I'm having up in February, but I also ha can, I've put a class together. What we do is we design a piece, and um, we talk about what works for a casted piece. Not everything is casted ready. You might have to solder bezel couple one or or something like that afterwards. So um, we talk about how to design a piece that, so it doesn't have undercuts and, and things like that that make it hard to cast. Um, we talk about the kind of molds that we need and how to have a conversation with a caster and not sound like a complete newbie. Um, so I also, um, uh, you know, you sort of want to sound a little knowledgeable, um, not sound a little knowledgeable, be a little bit knowledgeable so that when you go through the process um, and they're telling you something, you know what, they're, what, what the vocabulary is all about. So it's just walking you through making a piece, the process, and then um, getting it casted. And I can refer you to several different casters that, that I'm pleased with. Okay, and this might be, well, I don't know really a touchy subject, but there were several questions. Uh, people are concerned whether they can make a living, of course, but they want to know um, in, in a couple instances, um, do you have to mix that with anything? Can you, you know, of course, everybody's situation is, is different, but can you mix, you know, selling your jewelry, do you need to mix it with teaching or some other kind of income producing things? I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to that or not. Well, yeah, that, that has so many variables to it. So I don't know if I can have a one straightforward answer, but what I would say is, um, can you make a living? Yes, I think you can make a living, but you have to be savvy at marketing. You really have to wear a lot of hats when, when you're a jewelry maker. It's not just being good at your craft, it's knowing how to market yourself and knowing how to get into the right shoes and things like that. 
So I've done some one-on-one -on -one mentoring on, you know, basically what, what to look for in a show. You know, before I ever do a show, I want it to have a good reputation. Um, I want to know, is it a jury show or is it the kind of show that anybody, I'm standing next to grandma's pot holders, which are probably beautiful, but is that the kind of show I want to be in? Or do you want to be in a more high-end show? Um, how do you find out about their reputation? Well, you go to them. You talk to the artists. Um, a lot of times, there's a book, I think it's Sunshine, that has like all the different um, shows in it, and you can get their statistics. And if you, so you have to be able to call the um, person who's managing the show, and they need to be able to answer those questions. How many people are coming through? How much is being spent on average at the show? And so um, being market savvy is, is pretty important. You, you, the days of just standing behind your booth, reading a book, well, they were never a good day. Anyway, for anybody that does this, that's not a good day. You, you need to know how to talk to people and be active and how to you know, display things and things like that. So if you have these various elements, sure, you could, you could make a living. Did that help? <laughs> a... I think that's about all the questions that I have. Um, yeah. So uh, I think one last question came in. Oh, yep. It did. Okay. It's a question about the art of designing a signature jewelry line. Um, Barbara wants to know if she would be able to make pieces during those 10 weeks, or is it more soul searching and drawing ideas, et cetera? Um, it's a combination of both. Um, people have approached my classes in different ways. Um, I have a class going on now, the design, the, the design class, and somebody missed four sessions, but I do record them. And a lot of people do take it them take them at their own pace. Um, my gut feeling mm -hmm. is that you can do it during or after the class, but um, the time together is very valuable in that soul searching and being able to um, dedicate some time to it. So I think, uh, you know, the components are we're talking, we're soul searching, we're looking at different things. When you do each of the components of the learning, the learning is stronger. Is there anything else? Um, <clears throat> no, I don't, do not think so. Okie dokie. Um, so, I will see you all on Metal Clay and Mixed Media. Maybe some of you will pop in tomorrow at uh, Chris's auction. Should be a lot of fun. And uh, thank you so much for coming. We heartfelt. Thank you.